Thanks, Arlene, and uh, welcome, everyone. Um, if you can just give me a little thumbs up or a little smiley face so that you can hear me fine. We'll just uh, wait to see. Okay, oops, I've got uh, Allison uh, gave me a one. I'm not sure what that means. Um, okay, so I'm just going to uh, share my application here, and uh, so hopefully you can all see um, see the application uh, in front of you. Okay. So here we go. So welcome to the session on citing using online tools. Uh, this is, uh, for me, this is an exciting topic because I think this is a, a place, a space where we can actually make a difference in kids' practices and help them be better scholars. Uh, now, it might seem funny to uh, uh, try and make bibliography uh, sound exciting, uh, and I know that I used to get a lot of eye rolling and groaning from my students uh, when I talked about bibliography, but I think uh, we have some ways that we can make this, um, make this interesting and relevant for them. I think students do understand the value of appreciating the works of uh, other people. Uh, I know that they give props to friends. There's a great little uh, expression that you should find on the Urban Dictionary, giving props, meaning uh, giving recognition and appreciation. Uh, they give props to friends when they do something worthwhile, and they will like ideas and memes and pages that appeal to them on Facebook and Tumblr. So I think there's actually uh, somewhere uh, in sort of the current social networking culture, the idea that we do uh, give a thumbs up, we do give approval, we do like the things that um, that are meaningful to us and the things that we approve of. Um, I think this, um, uh, the blogging, tweeting, and Facebook era really makes it easy to promote the idea of appreci appreciating someone else's efforts, uh, whether it's um, I don't know, a video of a great skateboard jump, for example. You post that on YouTube, you get lots of lots of your friends coming and looking at it and saying, yeah, that was great, and, uh, and approving that, tagging it, giving it a thumbs up. Uh, or some game design that uh, um, someone's really, really uh, happy about, and, and they'll, uh, they'll give props to that on a forum around games. Or some clever meme that's out there that makes people laugh, and again, you'll get the, the thumbs up on Facebook. How many times have you seen some funny little meme on Facebook, and you look and it's been liked by, you know, 400,000 people or something like that? So I think that the ease of copy-paste um, makes it really convenient uh, for kids to use other people's ideas and other people's uh, work, um, that whole culture of remixing and reusing. And so our job here is to give students the tools to make appreciating and crediting equally as easy as just simply copying and pasting. Um, the slide uh, that says, did you do this by yourself, uh, was part of my approach in talking to students. Um, I tried to get them to understand that, that no scientist works alone, uh, that it's all part of this vast cooperative effort. So the discovery of this person we see in front of us on the slide, her discovery adds to some other guy's theory that in turn makes yet another guy's invention possible. And so there's this synergy that's working together, all of that kind of stuff that happens. And it only happens if the, the scientist that we see in the slide knows who to go to, who to talk to, what work to reference, et cetera, et cetera. So every drug, every gadget, technique, invention builds on the work of other people. And so we do want to credit them um, so that scholarship can continue, inventions can continue, and also so that as adults living and working in the world, we also get credited um, when our time comes. So th does this make sense? Does this uh, give me a thumbs up if that seems to uh, ring true with uh, folks listening? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> good, very good. So. Um, I think another way to, to, to easily get, get at this whole idea of crediting and giving props is, uh, is to even address it around the whole the question of pictures and where they come from. Uh, I would show a picture like this to students and say, so I'm doing a project on, uh, on alligators or crocodiles or caimans or whatever this is. And so, you know, a picture that's included in a project and, um, you know, the project's handed in and it's all great, it's all wonderful. but uh, part of the question is, you know, where do we get all these resources from? I don't know what um, this fabulous reptile 
looks like unless someone has gone out and taken a picture for me. And I think an easy way to start thinking about bibliography is to think about, with younger kids anyways, to get them to reference pictures. So uh, I say to the students, you didn't crawl through the swampy jungle, you didn't get stunned by mosquitoes, you didn't get scratched up by branches and risk death to snap this photo. It was some nature photographer for uh, National Geographic or um, some other uh, publishing company or an independent photographer or what have you. So it would be really great to give this guy some credit for taking the picture that you're going to use in your project. Or at least uh, let people know where you got the original image from so that if they wanted to, they could go back and see maybe there's more images like this, maybe I want to, uh, maybe I'd like to use uh, something taken by the same photographer. So um, a simple way for younger kids is simply to list uh, the images from the original site. So again, not just the Google reference, but just backing through to that original site so you can find it. I just mentioned in passing that if you um, if you pull up, instead of just a straight Google search, if you pull up images.google.com, uh, you can actually um, paste in uh, pictures. You can drag and drop pictures into the search window, and it will actually go and look for any of the uh, pictures that are like this one, or even similar pictures. So that's a great way for, for students, if they forget where they got it from, to go back and, and, and source it, and a great way to track back the original source. So. As much as possible, when I'm trying to get kids to think about bibliography and crediting and appreciating, um, I try to uh, personalize the students by telling them a little story. So here's the story um, that I told uh, grade 8 and 9 students. I found it worked better with grade 8 and 9 and less so with 11 and 12, but I think we can probably um, all relate to this. So imagine that it's your mother's birthday and you've just spent three hours at the mall finding the perfect gift, slogging through the crowds and fighting with people and bargaining down to get the perfect gift. It was a lot of work, but of course it was worth it. Your mother's worth it. She will so love this present. And so you've wrapped it up beautifully and you can hardly wait to see her face. So then you all sit down at the dinner table, your dad and your siblings, everyone's gathered around, the candles on the cake are lit, your mom blows the candles out, and as you're about to hand her the gift, your sibling, who never plans ahead, never does anything, never gets your mom anything, grabs your gift off the table and presents it to your mother and says, I hope you like it, mom. I bought it just for you. Now, of course, you can imagine how uh, how do you feel about that? A little ticked off, a little betrayed. When I tell the story to grade eights, of course, they, there's an immediate reaction because there's that whole sibling rivalry, that rivalry thing. And so they get it that someone's put a lot of work into something and someone else gets the credit for it and how unfair that is. So I found that that little story actually is a great way to, uh, great way to highlight the whole giving credit thing. Uh, the kids are a little bit outraged, some of them feel ripped off, all that work, the moment of glory stolen away, uh, it's just not fair. So bibliography really is, um, uh, uh, is, is something that we recognize as important, but we have to translate that into something that the kids can really understand. And so one tack I take is to encourage students to look at other people's bibliography as a starting place for research because not only is it something you know good scholars will put at the end of their work, but when scholars are researching something, they'll actually kind of start at the back and work forward. They will look through papers, look at the bibliographies, and work backwards from the bibliographies to get a sense of um, of what the, the the breadth of the topic is. So um, one approach is to talk about bibliographies as a tool for research. So. Yes, you check out the article, the book, the blurb, the Wikipedia posting, whatever it happens to be, but look at the bibliography because here's a wealth of other sources to look at, other sources to consult. Um, uh, you, you can get a really good handle on a topic by working through um, the bibliography. And they can help us find all kinds of unexpected sources, uh, key in on important dates, 
help organize our thinking. And again, I say to the students, you know, really, we stand on the shoulders of all those people who have worked in this field. Um, we're not experts at this point, and high school students that I worked with, of course, are not experts on any of these topics, and they're not expected to be experts. In fact, we get to add our opinion or our findings or our observations or, you know, maybe our unique spin on top of what the experts have already put together. And so we read their perspectives, we look at their research, we get a sense of what they've come up with, we get to add our own two cents worth to the mix, and then we reference all of these giants that have come before us because we want to credit the people whose shoulders uh, we're standing on. It's not possible without, uh, without their work. And what I tell them, of course, is that uh, bibliographies can make a huge difference in understanding the topic. An annotated bibliography on a topic can really give you a sense of the scope of the question. Um, how much has been written on this? Uh, how well known is this topic? Or is it obscure? Is it widely discussed? Or uh, is, it, is it largely ignored? What's the, uh, what's the scope of this, um, of this question? Does this make sense so far? I'm looking to see for a thumbs up. Okay, a smiley face, good. <laughs> Great, okay. So um, so let's just say we've managed to convince the students that bibliographies are valuable to them for research, that citing and creating a bibliography is actually the right thing to do in terms of giving props to all of these researchers or scientists or commentators uh, who have gone ahead of us who are experts in the field. And so I guess the next question really is, um, so what are, what are we going to expect our students to do? What are we going to require of them? You know, it's, uh, it's a bit of an alphabet soup out there when you um, look to see what kind of bibliographic formats there are. I remember students saying to me, so Mr. Powell, there's only two kinds of, of formats, right? It's just it's MLA and uh, APA and that's it, right? Well, I, you know, I had to shake my head and say to him, you know, actually, pretty much every organization, every professional organization has its own way of citing material. And every, you know, the chemistry association, the physics association, the psychological association, they all have their own, uh, their own way of doing it, whether it's for legal or for scientific things or for humanities or what have you. So there's not two kinds, I had to sadly say to that student, and not just four kinds, there might be like as many as 20 different kinds. Now, fortunately for, for our purposes, there's really only four kinds that we talk about unless you get into some kind of a specialty area which, you know, once they're doing postgraduate work in, you know, uh, atomic chemistry or something, then they're going to have to learn something else. But um, so the basic, uh, the basic formats that we're looking at are um, APA, MLA, Chicago, and Turabian, which is really just a variation of the Chicago format. And so uh, explaining to the kids the differences between these, really, you know, it's um, they all have their own specific rules about punctuation and layout and capitalization. APA is mostly for social sciences, and so um, in those areas, you'll find that that is the predominant form. Um, the Modern Language Association style um, uh, guide is often used to write paper for the papers for the liberal arts and humanities, and this is what I tend to see more often uh, in high schools. Um, again, um, there's going to be special ways of formatting for uh, web references versus book versus uh, film, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, they've all got their own little idiosyncrasies. Um, Chicago is, uh, is another common method that you'll see, particularly at the college uh, level. Um, and they have their notes in bibliograph bibliographic format as well as the author date format, but in some ways very similar to the other two that, that we just mentioned in passing. Um, and then finally, the Drabian is a, is a modification of that that's really meant to be used. Um, I've seen that um, on uh, websites for senior students in high school. Um, and uh, the TL and the, the English department head decides that this is going to be um, the way that they're going to go. Does it really matter for the students which one to use? No, it doesn't actually matter. Uh, in fact, it's just a 
convention and different disciplines use different conventions. The, the key thing, of course, for the students is to be consistent so that you can go back and find uh, the references um, if you need to look, look at them again. And so, you know, we need to know who the person is and what they were writing in and what date it was published. And there may be other particular details around page numbers and volume numbers and URLs and all those kinds of stuff. It's really about um, creating a habit of mind around um, citing other people's work. So what, what should your school use? Well, that depends on your grade level. It depends on uh, the kinds of work that your students are doing. My take would be to talk to your, if you're high school, I would say talk to your department heads, pull them together, and see if you can get them all to agree on one style. Um, MLA is great. Um, but ultimately, it doesn't really matter where the comma goes and the period goes and all that kind of stuff. It's really about um, giving recognition to the sources that you use for writing your paper, doing your research, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, would I spend time teaching how to do a bibliography from scratch? You know, when I first began uh, as a teacher librarian, I had the sheets with the style guides and I had um, papers printed out with the blanks on them and had kids, you know, write out uh, what they were. And then I had um, handouts, uh, two-page handouts that students could borrow from the library that explained all the different features and all the different aspects. And, you know, I could, I could see the kids' eyes glaze over as they were looking at those pages. And I came to the, under, the understand the conclusion that those little, picky little details um, were actually detracting from the task of easy referencing. So just as kids can copy paste with a, you know, an Apple C and an Apple V and take something from one place and put it to the other, there needs to be a really easy way to get them to do bibliography. Now, uh, if you use Destiny as your library system, uh, Destiny has a little bibli uh, bibliography builder built right in. And if all of your students are using at the grade three and four level, let's say, or the grade five, six level, are things that you have in your library collection, you can have them generate a really easy bibliography just by uh, using the Destiny tool itself. Um, if your kids are just doing beginner projects and they're all they're using is WorldBook as their source information, well, WorldBook gives the references at the end of every section. So a starting point could be to have those kids just copy and paste out of uh, the World Book article to give them their uh, their references so that you can go back and look at the article. Um, for me, the discovery was really BibMe, uh, an online tool that I think captures all of the ease of use and uh, um, the functionality and gives the kids a really, uh, a really easy way to create the bibli bibliography so that it's not the thing they do at 1 o'clock in the morning on Sunday night uh, as they think, oh, you know, my project's due on Monday and I've done everything, and oh, yeah, the bibliography. Instead, uh, using the, these online tools, they can build their bibliography as they go. They can add to it. They can share it. There's all kinds of great things that they can do. So what I'd like to do uh, uh, after this little introduction here, then, is to um, tell you about my experience with BibMe and then we're going to have uh, a little blurb on EasyBib, and then finally on Noodle Tools. So just before I go any further, I just wonder if anybody has any questions about any of the stuff that we've looked at so far. And I'll just turn my mic off. OK, I'm back. So I guess um, uh, I guess that's good. Everything makes sense so far. So um, I'll just um, mention, uh, I'll just scroll quickly back up to the top of the page here. The presentation that I'm doing with you today, this web page that I'm showing, it's actually a web page. Um, I've created a shortened uh, Google URL for it. So I'll just scroll back to the top of the page so you can find it. And all of the, the links and things that I talk about are actually uh, live in that document. So let me just scroll back up to the top of the page. Um, and so uh, you can see it's there, it's goo.gl slash, and then the letters uh, have to be capitalized in this case, so Z93EY, uh, and that will allow you to, um, uh, to, to get this presentation. In case you wanted to use uh, some part of it, and I'm just going to paste that into the, the chat box too, just in case you want to um, um, 
have that. Uh, sometimes you can, you know, you might be able to take something and adapt it, and then uh, and then use it to represent to your own students. Might be handy for that. So, uh, uh, without further ado, then, um, oh yeah, I see some uh, some questions down here. Let's see. Um, uh, uh, do you get students to use Creative uh, Commons images? Uh, Creative Commons uh, images. Good question. You know, one of the things that I've been using lately for kids to create um, uh, slideshows is Haiku Deck, and let me just type that in there in case uh, Haiku Deck. So it's actually a um, uh, it's actually a uh, an iPad app and. One one of the things you do is when you when you go to create your slides, you can search for images, and it searches them uh, in Flickr uh, only images with Creative Commons. And so what's an, and it also references the image. So each one of the slides that it creates has a little tab where you can see who the photographer is, which is a great way to instantly reference things. And so the images that I've chosen. Uh, the slides for this are actually taken out of Haiku Deck, and I, there's a little asterisk beside the images if you look really closely. And if you click on it, it'll tell you who the um, uh, it'll take you actually to the Flickr homepage of the person who took the picture. So, uh, you know, that's another way of referencing uh, the materials. Um, yeah, and and as Allison said, there's there's there are other um, ones out here. And when we were talking, uh, Arlene and Jeff and I, about doing the session, we, we, you know, we were having this little back and forth about bibliographies and um, tools. And uh, Jeff said, well, he uses EasyBib. And I said, well, I use BibMe. And uh, Arlene said, well, she uses Noodle Tools. So we thought, you know what, we'll just give a little blurb about each of those. Um, and they're, they're not the only ones out there, but they're the ones that we're using um, at the moment. So let me just um, flip over to BibMe here. So. Um, uh, bid me. This is the uh, the URL for them. I'll just um, paste it in as well, just because. Um, and the thing I liked about Bid Me uh, uh, when I was looking for a bibliographic tool is a, a couple of things. I wanted it to be to not require a sign up. And so Bid Me, you can actually use it and build your bibliography sort of on the fly. Um, and within the one session, you get a complete bibliography, and you don't have to sign up or do anything. Um, there's no cost to it, which was another thing that um, that appealed to me. Um, but students did, do have the option of creating an account on there, and all they need is an email address. Uh, they do have the option of creating an account, and it, in which case it will give them a few uh, a few more bells and whistles. These all work pretty much the same, uh, but let me just walk you through the, the features. Um, so uh, what I liked about um, using Bibme with the students is that in each case there, there, there's a tab for each of the different kinds of source they might use, book, magazine, newspaper, website, etc. And uh, rather than having to write down all of the, the details about all of the resources, they just needed to have enough of the information so that um, so that Bibme would be able to identify for them. So in the case of a book, for example, really, I mean, title and author is fine. Uh, ISBN is even better. And so uh, pasting in the ISBN will, will automatically pull up um, a book with uh, all of the fields filled in. And then the student just has the, a moment to check to make sure they've got the right edition, or yes, in fact, uh, it's not, I haven't picked the wrong author, or it's the right author. Uh, and then they can simply add it to their, um, to their selection. There's manual entry for everything as well, so that on the, in the times that a book is not available in the database, sometimes you know with French books they don't off, they don't have all of them there. So then the student has the opportunity to plunk in um, the missing pieces, and once they've done that, um, uh, they, they can simply click the Add to My Bibliography button at the bottom of the page, and then it captures all of that information. Uh, puts in the appropriate spaces, commas, periods, etc., and then paste that in the correct order. So I really quite like that. Um, it also gives you the option of uh, adding an annotation if you like. So in the case of a of a senior um, social teacher or science teacher who asks for an annotated bibliography, students can build their annotation uh, right in with the record, and then it gets added 
uh, to the bibliography itself. This is where you'd want to create an account because you're going to have to go back several times and, and, and work on this. Can't, this couldn't all be done in, in sort of one go. For websites, now this doesn't work for every website, but Bidme can often pull the URL and extract the basics. So uh, the top part of the, the fourth tab over the orange tab is the website tab, of course. And uh, you paste the URL in, and, uh, and then what it'll do is it'll go and query uh, the site. And whatever it can pull off the site, it'll, it'll pop into um, the various fields. Occasionally, you'll find a site where it fills everything in. It's a miracle. Um, usually, you'll get maybe about half the fields filled in. And depending on, um, uh, on the site, then you're going to have to, as a student, you're going to have to say, OK, I've got this basic information now. Is there an author listed anywhere? No. Nope. So in that case, I can click the radio button that says no author. Um, do I see evidence of any of these other things? Yes or no. Do I see a date created? Yes or no. Uh, and then, again, I have the option of adding an annotation if I want to, uh, and then click and add it to my, um, to my bibliography. And there's even actually the, the purple tab uh, is, a, is for specialized media, which they consider an encyclopedia to be one. So you can, if you're adding an interview or a lecture or a, a radio show or a photograph, to your bibliography, they give you the forms to put that information into. So it's really quite, um, I think it's quite versatile uh, for what it does. Once you've entered the material, then over on the on the right side of the tabs, uh, you, there's a little notepad where each of the citations appears. And uh, if we just look over here, uh, so you can see here's a sample of one. I just pasted a few things in. So we've got uh, we've got a book from Stenhouse. We've got a uh, CBC website, and we've got uh, a book from ASCD. And so here are uh, three items. If I decide I don't uh, want one of them, there's a little red X to click on to get rid of it. Um, I can uh, download it to Word if, I'm, if I have an account, if I'm logged in. I can save it to my account to look at later if I want to. Um, and if, I, if I've decided that I'm not going to sign up, then I can just simply copy-paste the contents of that little note pad and then paste it into a Word document, uh, and now I'm ready to go. Now you'll notice at the very top of the screen uh, where it's a select format, currently it's an MLA. And um, so the, the question here was, uh, does it cite using APA, MLA, Chicago? In fact, it'll cite using any of the four that we've talked about. So I can, it defaults to MLA, and so I can plunk all the things in. There it is. But if I have this you know, moment of realization, oh, my teacher wanted APA, then I just click on the tab, and it just reorganizes everything, and now it's APA. So it's brilliant, really. And you know, I've showed this to uh, student teachers, actually, who, you know, they're, they're tearing their hair out because they say, oh, I had to do an annotated bibliography. If only I knew it could be this easy. You know, it's, it's just one of those things. My daughter, who is in fourth year, uses this all, all the time for, for her stuff. Um, so as I said, you can easily uh, change, the, uh, change the format simply by clicking on, on the tab. A couple of other things then, you can, uh, if you have an account and you download it, it downloads it as an RTF, and then you can open that in Word or in, well, pretty much anything you want to, and preserves all the, the correct formatting. Uh, it just reminds you at the bottom of the page what kind of format, formatting it is so that you know that you've chosen the correct one. And then you can just edit that a little bit, take off that little tag at the bottom, um, and then you're, you're ready to roll as far as your bibliography is concerned. And for the student, this has not turned into sort of the, the, the hair pulling, oh, I've got to do my bibliography. It's like, oh, yeah, I've got to do my bibliography. It's not a problem. Um, you can save it to your account if you, if you decide to create one. Um, you can add tags so that you can, um, if you actually want to use um, uh, citations in other um, bibliographies, then you can do that. Um, and you can also um, uh, re-edit them. So you can go back in and you've saved it, come back and add another thing to it, save it again, come back two days later, add another thing to it. So you can actually build it, which is kind of nice. And what I do really like about it, finally, is the option if I, uh, if I have created an account and I save it on the account, so you can see there's an option to actually share my bibliography with someone else who's working maybe on the same project as me or on a similar project. So I could say to a student, to one student, uh, a, uh, a friend, 
I'll share my bibliography with you. We're working on a similar topic. You share yours with me. That way we can see what we're working on. So I think it's quite powerful that way. Um, so uh, what uh, does it cite using? Is it free for all types of citations? Yeah, you know, um, it, it's, it's free for, uh, for all of those formats. Um, uh, and uh, in, in my case, uh, I lean towards MLA because I think it's pretty straightforward. It seems to be the default one. And, um, and, and Digni is quite nice for supporting that. So uh, that's kind of my little presentation at the moment. And I'm just going to hand it over to, um, to Jeff, unless there's uh, any questions. OK, I think you can see the screen that I'm looking at. Hi, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. I, you know what? The, my, my presentation is going to be about three minutes because I've used EasyBib, I've used BibMe, and quite honestly, they're about 90% the same thing. <laughs> they're, they're really, it's, it's almost like someone said, let's have two separate citation makers. We'll just call them different names and use different colors. I'm not sure. But to me, they're almost the same. Um, as you can see on the screen here, I, I, I'm assuming you can see the screen. Actually, should I have a, can I give a thumbs up to make sure you can see the easy bib home screen here? Could someone just give me a thumbs up, please? Okay. Okay, good. Um, so the one thing about easy bib that, I, that we did go with was that, um, and this is a paid account. There are free accounts as there are with uh, BibMe, or sorry, uh, there are, are pay out free accounts um, as well that students can sign up for. They can just use it as a one-off. Um, we had a school account, which um, a school account, I think the cost was about 70 cents, 75 cents a student for a year. So we're giving it a try. Um, I really thought it would be worthwhile to do it. And what I like about this is you can customize the home page. You can see the home page here is customized. Um, you can put links to different websites if you want, if you want to populate this. Um, you can activate your Turnitin if you want to do that for your students as well. You have that option with a paid account. So this looks a little different than what you would do on the free one. Um, the website itself is, uh, is uh, easybib.com. Um, I can just put that in there right now. Um, if you're interested in more information. As Gordon said, um, again, you can populate create your own citation generator. This one here has got the top, at the top, it's got the, um, the tabs at the top, as you can see. I like this one here, the, all 59, or it's got the databases, sorry, databases here. And um, depending on which you choose with, if you decide that, you know what, you want your all, sorry, your all 59 options here, you've got everything that's here, letters, interviews, all different formats for citation. Again, APA, MLA, Chicago. Uh, Turabian as well. It does all four of the major ones. So same sort of thing. You find your URL that you want to use. If you are using a website, you pop it in there. You click on the Cite Me button or Cite This button. Again, as Gordon says, it doesn't populate all the fields. You do need to add some in. And of course, you encourage your students to go through that article that they plan on using it, go through the article as best they can and, and complete as many fields as they can so you, so you get the best possible citation. And again, um, you can add uh, annotated bibliographies. Um, um, and actually what I like about this is it actually shows your students how it's actually citing it. So your students are getting an idea. When you put in, for example, the publisher, it shows you how it shows up in the actual citation. So there's some learning going on there. There's some example, uh, examples. There's some modeling going on there that, that, that students can see if they are able to find the information for, the, um, for that website. And of course, when you click on Create Citation, at the top there, it adds the citation right there. And you can create multiple projects. What I like about this is at the top, if you see at the top there um, in the blue line, it says all projects, new projects, 2013, um, et cetera. So it allows you to create new projects. And once you've created one citation, you can now rename your project. And you now have multiple projects on the go at one time. Um, I also like the sharing feature, as Gordon said. Um, Bibme has the same email that you can invite others to join. You can make the link public if you want. Or you can export or print the document as a Word to your Google Docs. Even your
your SkyDrive, etc. Or you can just copy and paste it directly into, <clears throat> excuse me, a Word document that you have opened simultaneously. Again, no surprises here. Um, bib me easy bib, very, very similar. So here's the project I was talking about. And you can create a project um, and as you go along. Um, and you can obviously indicate what type of content it is. You can edit, you can share these projects, you can go back. Um, and that's one of the features I do like about Easy, Easy Bib. It has the multiple projects you can manage. Also has what, very similar to what Gordon was saying, it has this sort of note-taking um, ability. So <clears throat> if you, um, even as it, it's, it's an extra on top of the citation builder, you can create notes to create an outline to create your paper. So, for example, I create a new note on for this one here is on bats. I'm looking for any evidence from a text I've got from a direct quote, any paraphrasing, a comment I want to add. Um, and what I can do is I can then go, okay, I'm going to change it even more. I'm going to add another new note. In this case here, I've, I've found an evidence, a direct quote um, that I've used from this article from the source that's listed above. Um, I'll go click on Save Note, and what it does is it creates this worktop, this desk space that I can actually actually click on these and drag these around. I can reorder these, um, I can print them out, um, I can combine them if I want to, and it gives me an idea of what my paper is going to look like. It's sort of like that draft we always tell our students to work on. When we used to work on paper, we'd have our note cards, and then we'd move them around for our, as we were creating our paper, maybe. And we went to our rough draft. We drew from the note cards. This is what this is. It allows you for a thesis in the top right-hand corner, as you can say. Um, I like I like I go I like I do like the sticky note. Um, uh, and I have some students do use it for organization. It seems to work really well. Uh, and this is their workspace. Again, it'll save it. Uh, it'll it'll uh, and you've got those notes as long as you need to. Um, excuse me. <clears throat> EasyBib also comes with uh, great resources. They have a citation guide um, for the different types of the three main big ones that they're using. They offer um, information lit resources as well. You can get a newsletter if you want sent to you uh, for information that's being updated uh, regularly. Really good for students. I always direct students to this when they're having trouble. They need help with their, um, this is where I direct them. Uh, so you're looking again. This is part of the citation guide. This is what it, it actually takes a picture of a book and it says, okay, if you're going to cite a book, MLA style, here's what you look like. Here's how you can. Here's where you can find the title. Here's the publication date, and it gives students again where to look. So a lot of students spend a lot of time on websites, on books, not knowing where to actually find the information they need. Um, so again, not only does it does a citation, um, EasyBib has been a fantastic tool for teaching um, information literacy for students. I found that very powerful. Um, and I think it was about um, a couple of questions here, actually. I see. I'm sorry. I'm getting all, I'm missing all these questions. It, it is about um, it is about 75 cents a student. I can't remember what it was exactly. Um, it ended up being, yeah, about 75 cents a student for the year. Um, but yeah, it, it, Lindsay says, it does depend on the population. Some are higher. Of course, if you have a big school, then of course you're going to um, um, be charged more. I'm almost moved through this here. So the research guide, again, as I mentioned, for students um, to help them along. A lot of the information is there, and I, I show them this, and of course they become overwhelmed, and it always comes back to, to me as, as, as the person to go to. But I, you know, I, 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 it's nice for me to even to review this information. And of course, um, this, is the, this is the home page here that you can um, upload your information to SkyDrive, et cetera. So that is pretty much my component of the presentation. Um, I, I, I gladly take any questions if you want. Again, there's a free version of it. I'd recommend if you're curious, run a, take a test drive, free easy bib test drive, and, um, and it will, it will, I will, uh, I think you will uh, like the tool. If there any more questions people have, I'll just turn the mic out here and uh, give a few moments for some questions. So does the free version um, uh, only let you do the MLA? Is that the uh, is that the way it works? Yes, it does. That's one. I think that's one of the one of the uh, one of the lures 
um, one of the money makers is that if you want to see more. They're very good, like Lindsay Ross mentioned here. They're very responsive. It's a great group of people to work with. I've asked for training for a couple of teachers. They did a webinar just like that within a couple of days notice. They put together a really quick, easy webinar. And uh, the teachers, and they will do that for you. Um, they've been very, very flexible and very helpful with that. And I think that's part of the pay. You pay for the help. You pay for the service. And you are getting what you pay for. I really like this, this, um, this option if it's possible. Hi, Jess. I'm just wondering whether or not um, this is stored on Canadian servers, or is it American? Do you know? Hi, Jackie. Yeah, it's an, there, it, is an, it is American. Um, uh, there is uh, there isn't a Canadian one, unfortunately. It is, as far as I know, it's stored on um, American servers. They're from uh, the Midwest is the company headquarters. Um, but, I, yeah, I can't answer that question. Definitely, but I'm going to I'm going to go in a room and say it's an American company. But it's definitely not stored definitely not stored on Canadian on Canadian uh, soil. Okay, thanks. We were just wondering about that with Noodle Tools as well because they are also American. Thanks. I guess that you know for for me that's one of the uh, uh, one one of the nice things about using something that wouldn't necessarily require a sign, and you don't get as many options, of course, but you can get your bibliography done without necessarily leaving um, a trace anywhere, a, a, a personal trace. Absolutely. That's always a concern, isn't it, um, and these kinds of, these kinds of tools. Um, but here, it's not so much personal information. I think this is shared information. I think this is information that, personally, I don't, I'm not concerned. I, I don't have a concern about this. I've got no personal information on other than my email, of course, it's needed to, for login purposes anyways. Um, but I, I, I do like the personalization and the help that we've received with, with paying, uh, paying for the service. Uh, the problem is getting around to teachers and getting the word out. I think we all share that in our jobs. Um, but once they show a teacher, I have a convert. Once you show a couple of students, you have converts. It doesn't take long. I think uh, Arlene and Gordon would, would agree with that. Okay, I'm going to turn it over to Arlene. Thanks, Jeff. I'm kind of chuckling away here because um, there may be a little eyeball rolling by the time you folks go through a third uh, session of a different, uh, sorry, a different citation maker. Um, so, actually, it is kind of funny because Gordon and Jeff and I were so vociferously arguing for our particular citation maker that we decided we'd, we'd show them all. So, um, the one that we use at our school is called Noodle Tools. And um, it's, uh, it is an American company. Um, it's, it's operated by a mom and, mom and son duo. The mother is a TL, um, a, you know, an award-winning TL. And the son you know, has his master's in computer sciences. Uh, it has many, I, I'm seeing many of the same features throughout um, both Jeff and Gordon's presentation. But I'll, go, so I'll try not to take too long um, on some of this because it's similar. But I'll try and go through anything that I think is a little bit different. So the first thing that we do is have our students sign in to uh, Noodle Tools. And I should say that um, our school does have a subscription. We've had it for several years. And the one thing I can say to you, whether you use Bidme or Noodle Tools or any of the other, other citation makers, I just think it's so powerful to have one, one particular, choose one, and have your teachers get, become aware of it. We have gotten to the point now where every single teacher in the school has endorsed using Noodle Tools. And all of our students um, in grade 8 and grade 9 and grade 10 have new bid accounts. And we have a, a scope and sequence for um, making sure that they understand how to use it. So, uh, oops, sorry. Once students have, um, have logged in, um, they will come to this page here. It's called the uh, project page. And much as uh, the other expectation makers, if you have a subscription, you can actually keep all of your uh, assignments, your, all of your bibliographies and the notes that you've taken uh, throughout your whole high school career, which is really, really neat. Um, you'll notice that this particular, for, for example, this project is in Chicago. Um, it's at a starter level. There are three different levels that Noodle Tools offers, and I'm going to go into that and show you what that looks like in just a minute. And in this case, um, this is a bogus student. I made this up. But this, there are three sources in this particular um, uh, assignment. 
There are two note cards that says when it was created. And of course, there's collaboration. You can share it with your teacher and you can collaborate with other projects. So I'm going to pretend that we would just go then and create a new project. Okay, so once we've got the project, this is where we get to choose between one of three citation styles. Um, our, our English uh, teachers like MLA because they like in-text referencing or parenthetical references. And our history teachers like Chicago because they like their students to create footnotes. Um, the starter session section only has six choices for sources that students would draw on. So a book, a database, a magazine. Very, very simple. So I'm just going to show you now what happens when you get into the advanced, which I would expect grades 11 and 12 would use. There are over 70 um, different choices of web sources. And teachers, I don't know about you, but sometimes in the old days, I used to have trouble figuring out how to cite a source and students would come to me and I, I would think, oh gosh, I'd be in that huge Chicago book, you know, that style book. And an hour would go by while I was looking at Gordon, you'd probably say, well, just forget it, which I probably should have. <laughs> but anyway, if you look here, you can they show you how to cite a tweet, a microblog, Facebook, Wiki, Wikipedia any number of different resources, you know, as well as all the traditional resources that we have. I'm going to carry you forward in a starter mode, so as if we had put the starter section here, and we're looking at the French Revolution. Um, when, the, when we hit Create Project, it brings the student into a dashboard on that particular project, which is the French Revolution, Social 9. They can put in their research question, eventually their thesis statement. And there are a number of other things that they can do here on the dashboard. One of them I think that is most important is they can share with their teacher. Our teachers are using the drop boxes and having their students drop their bibliographies and their annotated bibliographies, particularly in the drop boxes. And I'm going to show you that later too. And then they can collaborate with their, um, with their peers. So the next thing they would do on this dashboard is probably create a bibliography, and that's really what we're here to talk about mostly. So I'm going to check to the next slide. Okay, so we're in the starter mode. We only have six choices, and we're going to create the citation, and I'm just going to show you what it looks like to create a book citation. I wanted to point out that just as, um, as the other citation makers allow students to pull in and populate all these boxes automatically, it can be done on Moodle Tools as well. If you have the ISBN of the book, you put it in here and then uh, go through a couple of click, click, clicks and all of a sudden all of this information comes up. I didn't put that in. And down here you can, uh, the student can put their uh, annotation in. I wanted to talk for a minute about um, creating a citation for a website. Um, and I also want to just mention that there is information here for a database. When we have students do our, their databases, I will point it out to you where, uh, in a later slide, but there is a section where you can copy and paste a pre-made citation uh, into MoodleBib. And uh, we encourage to, to do that with the database citations because they are so lengthy and difficult. And, They've been filtered several times already through the publisher, the editor, and through us selecting that database. We really don't need them to be, quite, obviously they have to be somewhat critical in their use of any uh, information sources, but I think less so with that. But here's the websites, which for me, this is where I, I teach information literacy and, um, and trying to create a culture of academic integrity when we're teaching how to set a website. I, I wanted to mention that this is the first slide a student will see right here when they click on, um, when they ask for the website citation. If they choose to, they can click on show me and there's a lengthy slideshow that they can watch or the teacher for new students can show them this slideshow. I'll show you just a couple of slides to see what it looks like. Um, just so that you know, if they've seen it once, obviously they don't want to see it again, they just hit continue to get right to making their, um, their citation. So the slides that are provided, um, here, here they are on the bottom. They're very extensive, they're great to teach from. They teach students um, how to critically evaluate uh, all different kinds of websites. 
I, I use this a lot. Uh, I think that I like to teach from um, from citations. I teach my information literacy skills course, uh, lessons from the citations that students are making. So I, I teach them about the URL and how to truncate it down to try and find the publisher if there isn't a home page. Um, the web name here and how they can uh, determine it by looking up here if they're looking for the name of the website and, and a number of other things. But also, um, how to find the publisher, which is the hardest thing that they seem to uh, confront. So here's, uh, here's what it looks like when they get into actually having to populate the page with information. And this is the one area that I want them to do it manually because I find that when they do it automatically, um, they aren't necessarily looking critically at what they are, the source that they're using. So again, this is where um, if they're having trouble uh, finding the publisher of the site, which would be this, uh, because there's no about page or no home page, then that's just such a great opportunity to show them how to truncate down to the domain and go to the sort of the filing cabinet that's holding the file that they've been looking at. It also, you know, looks into if, if we're able to find out who the author is, we can establish some authority possibly and currency and all of those important things that we, we want to teach our students um, to be more critical in, in what they're using. There is not one more thing I wanted to mention, and that is um, that our students are largely information agnostic. That is, they're not really uh, discriminating between, a, say, a journal article or a, a popular magazine or a blog. And I think that there's huge value in citations for that reason as well, because it starts to make them think about what their source is. Any source is valid. It just depends what your purpose and need are. So this is what it looks like when they finish. They have a uh, citation from a website, it's indicated, and there actually are some graphics that will tell them how many websites they've used and how many, relative to how many books they've used and that kind of thing. They can print this and it looks identical to what, uh, I think it was Jeff who showed a printed or maybe more printed version. So it can be just handed in a properly formatted bibliography that's in alphabetical order with the indented uh, second line and subsequent lines. What's really neat is they also offer the format for footnoting. So here's the footnote if it, as it appears the first time, and here is the second and subsequent footnotes. Kids are really happy to have this. They can cut and paste it into the bottom of their page on a Word document. And then, of course, there's lots and lots of information as to what a footnote is and um, when you should use the shortened form. The same is uh, supplied for MLA versions. They do show you how to do parenthetical citations as well or in-text citations and what that would look like. So um, you can also attach a note, and so similar to what Jeff was showing us before, and this is where you would create a new note. And I do like, and, and one of the other two sources was doing this as well, I love the fact that students are being asked to um, distinguish between direct quotations and between their own um, paraphrased material. As well, at the bottom of the page, they're uh, given an opportunity to write down some of their ideas and, and what they have to do next and all of that kind of thing. So this is kind of neat too. This is what the note picking, um, what the kind of the table looks like here. And there are two notes under the topic of legacy. So this, 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 in this case, the, um, the essay is on the French Revolution. They're talking about Napoleon and his legacies as a subtopic. And then one of the legacies was legal structures. So they can cre create complete outlines here as well. Um, and I'm just reading, Jackie saying, can I show the analysis of the bibliography? Jackie, I'm sorry, I didn't actually do a screenshot of that. Um, but the, the, that is what I referred to before when you can, it will actually show graphically and in, in full color um, an analysis of the different kinds of sources that you've used. Yeah, probably it is similar to EasyBiz. And certainly no cards seem to be too. What I love about this is that you can create a Dropbox on any of the papers that your students are doing for any block, and this would be me creating my Dropbox, and I can add all sorts of links to course links, uh, here notes on Germany and Europe, and here World War I Google Bookshelf. I can create a whole bunch of links within this citation um, tool. And this is the teacher version of sharing the setup, 
And the next slide is this button, student see. So we can see here that the student is sharing American History 12. And you can see, um, and I'm having trouble, it's so little, but you can see the links down here that I had uh, set down for my students. Now, what the teacher sees of the student's work follows here. So here I am in a student's bibliography. I can get right inside their bibliography once they've, they've cited um, a source. I can see that they're citing this guy, Ellis, Jeffrey Ellis. And I can actually say to them, oh, that's a really good choice. Ellis is well regarded in this field. Or I could say, um, with respect to PBS and grade 12, using it. Not a bad place to start, but please make sure that you get some primary sources. There are all sorts of um, comments you might want to make. And I think um, I also want to just talk a little bit about valuing the process. It, we have to, I think we have to slow down a little bit and, and let our students know that we are valuing what they're doing when they're creating these bibliographies and have that chat back and forth with them. Um, and also even maybe give them some marks for the, the bibliography um, just in terms of the process. And it certainly isn't about formatting at all anymore, but it certainly is about that um, creating that culture of academic integrity and showing that we value it. I'm um, trying to read here. Um, I guess it might be like a course management system. So this is my last slide. And I, I come here because there are lots of free tools on Moodlebib. And just huge, huge information piece here on 21st century literacy. Um, and not only that, but just to mention that I discovered Moodlebib when I was doing my master's eight years ago. And I used all the free tools at that time. And that's, um, that's how I thought, wow, this is neat. And just like I think to again, Gordon or Jeff said, the young teachers at our school, when they when they are introduced to this, they're saying, why didn't I know about this at university? I wish I had because I can connect all of my um, sources to my notes and it's so organized. And gee, I wish I had known how to do this when I was going to school. So uh, that's my uh, my presentation on Moodle tools. It's been a lot of fun facing off against the other two guys. <laughs> I think they're all really good. I'm going uh, to let uh, Gordon take over and close for us. Here you are, Gordon. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, well, I hope everyone had a chance to uh, uh, to maybe explore these a little bit with us. Uh, I think this is a good opportunity to see what's out there. I had never looked that closely at Noodle Tools, actually, so this has been a really good opportunity for me to see what some of those um, those key things are. And although I had sort of browsed through easy bit, it was nice to see a little in a little bit more detail. I think um, I think underlying all of this is it's not so much which one we use, but it's the, it's uh, as Arlene mentioned, that teaching piece behind it, so kids understand why we're doing this, the value of it, the usefulness of it. And the tool just makes that whole punctuation, comma, space business, um, um, that, that problem part of it go away, and then we, f we focus on the underlying reason for why we're doing this. So um, I don't know if there's any last uh, minute questions. Um, I'll just uh, take uh, let the mic go back to the group for just a sec in case there's a last minute question. Well, I think we had a lot of fun today, and as Arlene mentioned, it was a little bit of a cage match. You should have seen us at the executive meeting as we uh, arm wrestled over which one was the better one. Uh, hope we've given you some food for thought. And uh, you, if you're not currently using some kind of tool, you might, uh, you might think about exploring some of those options and seeing how you can support your kids and your students. Thank you very much for attending, everyone. And uh, stay tuned for news about the Summer Institute. Uh, uh, check the BCTLA site uh, frequently, and we'll have some information for you about that. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone.